Good evening, everyone. I think we're going to get started and try to keep the program timely. I'm Dr. Matt Wayne, chairman of the Alzheimer's Association Cleveland Area Chapters Professional Advisory Board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2011 annual Foley Lecture. We wouldn't be here today celebrating the 24th Foley Lecture if it weren't for its namesake, Dr. Joseph Foley. Dr. Foley is recognized around the world as a gifted and dedicated teacher, an innovative and groundbreaking researcher, and a concerned and compassionate physician. He is also one of the founders of the Cleveland Area Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. 24 years ago, the first annual Joseph M. Foley MD lectureship was held in 1987. It was established to recognize the many invaluable contributions Dr. Foley had made and continued to make to people and families struggling with this devastating disease. The association made a commitment to bring a nationally recognized expert in Alzheimer's disease to Cleveland annually to educate both caregivers and professionals in the Cleveland area. This is one of the tasks that the Professional Advisory Board uh, focuses on, uh, on a yearly basis, is developing this particular lecture and providing cutting edge and current knowledge for you. And I think you'll agree uh, that tonight is, is no exception uh, of, to kind of take its place along with all the wonderful lectures that we've had in the past. So we continue our longstanding tradition with this year's Foley lecturer, Dr. David M. Holtzman. Immediately following his lecture, Dr. Holtzman will join a distinguished panel of our local experts to discuss the issue of detecting Alzheimer's disease prior to memory loss. So tonight will be a two-part. First, uh, a lecture from Dr. Holtzman, and then a more interactive session uh, with other members uh, on a panel. First, Dr. David Holtzman is the Andrew B. and Gretchen P. Jones professor, professor and Chairman of Neurology, Professor of Developmental Biology, Associate Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and a member of the Hope Center for Neurologic Disorders at Washington University. He attended the Honors Program in Medical Education at Northwestern University, receiving both his BS and MD degrees. He did his medical internship, followed by neurology residency at the University of California, San Francisco. I suspect the weather might be a little bit better than what we're seeing today. At UCSF, he established the Memory and Cognitive Disorders Clinic and was an assistant professor from 1991 through 94. He moved to his own laboratory at Washington University in 1994 and was named Associate Professor of Neurology in 2001, Professor in November of 2002, and as the Andrew and Gretchen, Gretchen Jones Professor and Head of the Department of Neurology in October of 2003. In addition to his laboratory, administrative, and teaching duties, Dr. Holtzman is involved in clinical and research activities at the Washington University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Past honors include being the recipient of a Paul Beeson Physician Faculty Scholar Award in Aging Research, the 2003 Potamkin Prize for the American Academy of Neurology for Research on Alzheimer's, election to the American Society for Clinical Investigation, receiving a Merit Award from the NIA, and a 2006 recipient of the MetLife Award on Alzheimer's disease, as well as election to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2008. So it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce to you Dr. David Holtzman. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and to the Alzheimer's Association in the Cleveland area for inviting me to give the Foley Lecture this year. It's a great honor and uh, I'll try to uh, convey some of the information that I'll be presenting in a way that uh, will be understandable, but if you don't, if something is not clear after the lecture we can certainly, we'll have a panel and we can talk about some of the details in, in, uh, more extensively. All right. So I think you have handouts from this information, so I'll move right into the lecture. So um, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page in regard to the, the, the uh, topic today, I just want to make sure we're, uh, we'll define some terms. So probably everybody here knows the definition of dementia. So it, it 
It essentially means that there's a decline in memory and other cognitive abilities that are sufficient enough to impair social and occupational functioning. There's a lot of different things that can cause someone to become demented. Um, one, of, uh, one of the most common things to cause dementia uh, in people over the age of 65 is Alzheimer's disease, but um, many, many people can get dementia for other reasons. It can cause, be caused from strokes, be caused from other diseases like Alzheimer's, but not Alzheimer's. So I want to make sure everybody understands Alzheimer's is not the only thing that causes dementia. Um, the reason, though, that everybody is so interested, I think, in Alzheimer's disease uh, and dementia in general is that it's extremely common. So the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is only about two to four, or dementia is only about two to four percent at, age, at the age of 70. But in people over the age of 85, the prevalence is close to 50 percent. And obviously, because medical care is getting so much better in general and people are living longer, this is becoming an increasing uh, problem in our society that we have no good answer to yet. So the clinical features of the disease you're probably familiar with, but let's just go through those. So there's typically uh, a very gradual, almost imperceptible onset of the disease. Um, and now I'm specifically talking about Alzheimer's disease, not other causes of dementia. Usually what people tend to notice first are trouble with uh, certainly a, a colleague or a spouse or a friend will notice that the patient is developing trouble with recent memory. Now, it turns out even in the earliest clinical phase of the disease, memory is not the only thing impaired. Almost always there's trouble also with what we call executive function. So this would be things like problem solving, like balancing checkbook, um, taking care of numbers, and also um, attention, switching from thinking from one thing to another thing or multitasking. Usually those things happen about the same time as trouble with recent memory. And um, uh, sometimes uh, language dysfunction is seen very early, but usually it's seen a little bit after the changes in memory and uh, executive function. Um, there is often also visual spatial dysfunction that occurs sometimes at the beginning of the, of the disease, but usually a little bit later. Um, and behavioral dysfunction is prominent, um, but usually early on. Apathy is probably the most common thing. Uh, but depression is, is sometimes seen. Um, certainly delusions and hallucinations can occur often later in the disease, but some, sometimes early on. Uh, the course of the disease is not always the same, um, but on average from the onset of symptoms until somebody either um, dies from something else or due to the disease, it's about 8 to 12 years. We certainly, everybody has seen cases where people live longer than that with the disease or shorter. Um, we tr generally, uh, where I work, classify the stage of the disease into four very straightforward categories. So very mild, mild, moderate, and severe. Very mild would be somebody who still pretty much can live on their own. Mild is somebody who might be able to live on their own but usually needs some uh, assistance from others as well. Moderate is somebody who, who definitely cannot still live on their own anymore, and severe would be somebody who needs really total care. So based on the symptoms and signs of the disease, um, we can usually now recognize Alzheimer's disease very early in its clinical manifestations, much earlier than we ever, I think, used to. Certainly, when I first began training, I would say most physicians would not diagnose this disease until it was in now what we would call the mild stage. But the very mild stage, which can last sometimes from anywhere from two to six years or longer, is often diagnosed now um, by many people. Um, and I'll show you an example of somebody with what one, one might be called a, the middle of the very mild stage. So there's two major types of Alzheimer's disease. There's the early onset familial form, which is quite rare. It's less than 1% of all of cases of Alzheimer's disease, but um, we've been learning a lot from um, individuals who have this form of disease, and um, we're hopeful that the, what we've learned from studying people with the early onset form will both help that population of people with new treatments, but also even people who have the later onset form. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Then there's the late onset form, which is the most common form of disease, usually after the age of 60. Um, 
this is uh, also uh, like the early onset form. There is early onset form is due to a uh, mutation in one of three genes, and if you have one of those mutations, you will get the disease. Whereas the late onset form, there's strong genetic uh, uh, inheritance of the disease, but it's not 100 percent like the early onset form. So the two strongest risk factors for the late onset form are age, and also genetics. Um, as I just met, as I mentioned earlier, obviously this is a, a really a crisis in in brewing in regard to Alzheimer's disease. And this is a slide from the Alzheimer's Association, which estimates right now there's a little more than five million people in the United States alone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think this is a of disease, which some people call mild cognitive impairment. Some people who have that um, uh, nomenclature have Alzheimer's disease already. So if you included those people, it's probably more like 10 million people, not 5 million people. And um, it's predicted by 2050 there'll be like three times more cases than we have now. And that's mostly just because um, in our society, the baby boomers are just hitting 65 right now, and people are going to live longer, and um, we know that age is a major risk factor. The most useful thing that I find in trying to determine if somebody's having a problem or not is talking to somebody who knows the person. Because if somebody does is start developing a dementia or trouble with memory and thinking, sometimes they have insight in their problem, but a lot of times they don't. And you can certainly, and so you really need, I think, to talk to the person who knows the person well. And we do this separate than an interview with the subject or with the participant. And then the second major, th so clearly there was troubles that she's noticing now for a few years. It probably was not seven years. It turned out maybe a little shorter than that. But regardless, I mean, you could tell she noticed some, you know, significant trouble. And yet when you, in if you just interview the patient, you know, he made one error on counting threes backward from 20. But he was pretty darn quick. And if you only spent time with the person, you might have overlooked the fact that he probably does have some trouble. And I think this illustrates, um, you know, why we spend a lot of time with, with uh, family members and friends in making the, di the clinical diagnosis. Um, so I, I think this person ended up being rated with very, still with very mild dementia. He could still do a fair number of things, but, you know, wasn't normal anymore. And so uh, I, I'll come back to this person's story in a moment as we talk a little bit more about the underlying changes in the brain that cause these kinds of problems. So um, if you um, look at this picture, this red circle is um, highlighting uh, the man from which this disease is now named after Alwa Alzheimer. So he and his colleagues described a patient in the early 1900s in Germany that ended up having what we now call Alzheimer's disease. And what Alzheimer and his colleagues described at that time was the changes in the brain that, appeared, that occur in people with this disease. So he described a few things back then. One uh, were there's two neuropathological features that are hallmarks of the disease. One are these pictures you can see here. Uh, this is a microscopic picture of the brain. And you can see these structures called plaques. These plaques are made up of a protein that is made by our body all the time. But in Alzheimer's disease, normally this protein is freely, it's made, it's produced, it's cleared away. But in Alzheimer's disease, it builds up in the brain and appears to be one of the things that's damaging the brain. The other major lesion of the disease are these black uh, structures, which are inside nerve cells called neurofibrillary tangles. And this uh, is made up of a protein called the tau protein. And this protein also builds up in nerve cells in the brain and appears to be damaging the brain. He didn't, Alzheimer didn't know that at the time. He just described these lesions. In addition to these lesions, there's also some other changes in the brain in the disease. One is you can see that the brain shrinks. There's loss of nerve cells that subserve the functions of memory and thinking. And there's also loss of the connections or synapses between nerve cells. And then finally, there's inflammation in the brain, like occurs, for example, in arthritis and our joints. There's inflammation that also occurs in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. This next picture is a schematic uh, drawing of this pathology just in a cartoon format. And again, it shows these major lesions of the brain where you get these things called amyloid plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles. You get these inflammatory cells around these lesions. And then you also get damage to the nerve processes going on. 
So the next slide, I'll just spend a moment on if I hope it's not uh, getting too scientific, but I'll just try to explain at least what a lot of people in the field think might be going on in the disease at a, at a very high level. So um, this amyloid protein, or A-beta protein, is what builds up in the plaques in the brain. And um, there's a lot of reason scientifically to think that it's important in the disease. And the reason many of us believe that is from the genetics of the disease. So in the rare early onset causes of, uh, early onset form of Alzheimer's disease, this amyloid protein, which builds up in these plaques, turns out to be overproduced due to gene mutations that are carried by the people that develop the disease. So if you have a mutation in one gene called presenilin, this gene mutation causes more of the amyloid peptide to be produced from this other protein called APP. So if more of this protein is produced over time, the higher the level of the protein during your life, the more likely it's going to build up in the brain. <clears throat> There's all, the, the common form of Alzheimer's disease that occurs later in life there's a major genetic risk factor for the common form called apolipoprotein E. And one form of that gene called ApoE4 causes your risk to be much higher to get Alzheimer's disease. And what ApoE appears to do, at least in part, is it doesn't cause too much of this protein to be produced, but it appears to influence what's called the clearance of the protein. So if, you, if your drain is clogged up, some things build up. And it, it appears that this protein plays a role in whether this protein will be cleared out as well. And if it's not cleared out, it can build up earlier than otherwise would occur. The other major protein in the disease called tau is also probably very important in the disease. And this amyloid protein appears to somehow interact with this tau protein to also make it build up in the brain and cause more damage. So that's a very simplistic overview, but I think these are some of the things that science over the last 25 years has been revealing about the causes of the disease. It's not the whole story, obviously. Um, so if you remember back to the person I just showed you in the video, that person would be diagnosed by most people as having very mild dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, just simply based on the classic history that was presented. So it turns out that when people have that stage of disease, if they happen to die at that stage of disease due to another reason, let's say that gentleman happened to have a heart attack the next day, and you looked inside of his brain at autopsy, you wouldn't have found that that person's disease was very mild. What one finds when people die at that very mild stage of disease is that those amyloid plaques are filling a lot of his brain already. And the nerve cells that subserve memory in some parts of the brain, half of them are already gone. And that's why the message that we'll talk about more in a moment is that we probably in the longer run, maybe now only for research purposes, but for certainly for development of new therapies, we're going to have to diagnose the disease before the clinical symptoms start, I think, to really make an impact with therapies. And this really is very similar to things you're probably all very familiar with, with heart disease. You don't wait till you have a heart attack to start lowering your cholesterol. You get tested when you're 20, 30, 40 years old, and if your cholesterol is too high, you're likely to change your diet, or your doctor's likely to put you on a medicine called a statin to try to decrease your risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. And the same thing probably will be occurring in the longer run to try to prevent Alzheimer's disease. We're, want, we're going to have to use things called biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? It's simply a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of a normal biological process or a disease process or, or, or a response to a drug or therapeutic intervention. So for example, blood cholesterol is a biomarker for your risk to develop a heart attack. Blood, blood pressure is a biomarker for your risk of having a stroke. So we now just you know, take for granted that when these are abnormal, we get treated by our doctors. This is not the case yet in Alzheimer's disease. I don't think we're ready yet completely to use these markers, but I'll show you some of the data that supports that we are getting closer to be able to use biomarkers. So back 15 years ago, some of the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease began to be discovered. 
So what's known is that if you develop these amyloid plaques, well, actually, if, if people first started to be examined who clinically started having memory changes and had Alzheimer's disease as diagnosed by their physician, if you compared, the, so the spinal fluid bays the brain, and the proteins that are in the brain can be detected in the spinal fluid. So they started looking after doing what are called lumbar punctures or spinal taps on people who had Alzheimer's disease versus age match controls, whether the level of this protein called amyloid was altered in the spinal fluid. And what a lot of investigators started to find is that the level of this amyloid protein was lower on average in people, all these dots are individual people, they're lower in people with Alzheimer's disease versus controls. And this protein that is in the tangles in the brain called tau, it was elevated in patients with Alzheimer's disease versus controls. But if you look at that information up here, you'd say, well, yeah, generally it's higher in one group than another or lower than one group than another. But there's a big overlap between the groups. So that's not a very good test if you're trying to differentiate somebody who has the disease versus not. And this is when um, our group started to explore this a little bit further to try to understand whether this might be a good biomarker or not and what these markers really are telling us about the brain. So an idea that had been emerging in the field is that when this amyloid protein builds up in the brain, the normal form of the protein appeared to be, at least from animal studies and other studies, it was being sequestered into these amyloid plaques. And so the idea was, well, maybe the reason that the amyloid in the spinal fluid was low is that it's building up in the plaques and it's not escaping into the spinal fluid. It's sort of acting as a sink or being captured there. But the only way to really prove that is to know in a living individual if the spinal fluid results correlated with the presence of these amyloid plaques. And previously, the only way you could measure these plaques was at autopsy or do a brain biopsy, which is obviously pretty dangerous. So um, this field was really advanced by the advent of what's called amyloid imaging. And this was developed by Bill Klunk and Chet Mathis at the University of Pittsburgh. And what they were able to develop is a, as a molecule that could be injected in the vein of a person. And it would, the molecule is very uh, innocuous and it, it gets into the brain of everybody. And if there's amyloid plaques in the brain, the molecule binds there. But if there's no amyloid plaque, it, washes away. And then you could detect whether or not the amyloid plaques were present or not with this PET scan, so a, 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 a scan that's done at many hospitals. So what they found was that in patients with Alzheimer's disease, most of those patients had a lot of binding, meaning this, this color in the brain is orange, which means there's amyloid in the brain. And most of the control individuals they examined had a negative scan. So that was very exciting and, and led uh, to a lot of other studies. And one of the things that we began to do a few years ago, immediately upon the publication of this article, is we collaborated with Dr. Klunk and colleagues at, at Washington University in St. Louis, and we began to use this technique in combination with doing spinal fluid examinations. On, and these were done on research volunteers at our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Some of the volunteers had, had dementia, had very mild or mild dementia, but the majority of the people that we've been studying at our center are not demented, they're normal. And so we've been studying people who are anywhere from 45 years of age to 80 that are cognitively normal to try to detect if these changes are occurring when people are still normal before they become demented. And so one of the first studies we published is we looked at people who were demented versus cognitively normal and we asked the question, does this level of this amyloid protein in the spinal fluid called A-beta-42, is it low, like what other people have been finding, in dementia versus non-demented people? And you can see that, in fact, it was lower. But again, there was overlap between the people who were normal versus those who were demented. So again, it didn't appear to be a very good test by those criteria. But all of these people turned out to have an amyloid imaging scan as well as having a CSF test. And so the results look a little, a little bit different than this when you then use that comparison. Instead of asking whether the, the spinal fluid test correlates with the clinical state of the patient, does it correlate with amyloid state of the patient? And so what you see is the following. So basically, um, if you look on this graph, 
if you're to the right of this line, that means you had amyloid in the brain by imaging. And if, if, this, if you're below the line, that means your spinal fluid test is positive, your CSF amyloid test is also abnormal. So basically, everybody who had amyloid in the brain in the small study had an abnormal spinal fluid test. And everybody who did not have amyloid in the brain had a normal spinal fluid test. And what's important is that in this, even though it was a small study, these three red circles are individuals who are completely cognitively normal. These two people with triangles did not have amyloid in the brain by the, any of these criteria, and they had very mild dementia. But when we followed those two people longer, one of them turned out not to be demented, they were depressed, and the other one had another neurological disorder, not Alzheimer's disease. So I think even though this initial study was small, it tells you the power of using these markers to identify at least this pathology, and I'll show you more about whether these Measuring these things is actually useful from a clinical perspective. You want to ask a question before we? If you don't mind, so those, um, the controls, the, the, the three red circles, yes. or, or any of them, did they know that they were positive? No, so all of the studies I'm showing you now are on research volunteers who at the beginning of the study agree not, we, they, they, we are to, they're told and they sign a form that we cannot tell them the results of any of these tests unless we do a test that we would recommend that they do something different about their result. In other words, if, we, if they get an MRI scan and we see a brain tumor, we tell them immediately because they need to get treated. But these, we don't know what to tell people based on these results at this point. So we're using this to study the disease at this point. And I think in the future, these tests might be very useful in clinical trials, maybe clinically, although I would argue for the most part, they're, we do not recommend these tests yet to be done on patients, only research volunteers for the most part with some exceptions. Okay, so now we've actually studied not 20 people, we've actually studied about 300 people with these tests. And what you can see is essentially the same thing I showed you earlier. Mostly, people who have amyloid in their brain by this imaging test have a low amyloid level in their spinal fluid. And people who do not have amyloid in the brain by the imaging do have a high amyloid in their spinal fluid. Um, and there's a small subgroup of people who are kind of in between, and we actually think we're detecting the buildup of amyloid even before we can see it by imaging, but we need to follow people longer in order to determine that for sure. So one of the things that we've also been measuring is not just amyloid in the brain as is, is, is seen here. So if you're, to the, if you're farther to the right on this scale, it means that you have this PID binding, means there's amyloid in the brain. What we've been finding, and even in cognitively normal people, is that the more amyloid you have in the brain, the higher the level of a protein called tau, which is in those tangles. We think this means as amyloid builds up more and more in the brain, tau is a marker for degeneration of the brain. So it suggests that the more of this protein that's building up, the brain is beginning to degenerate. So the only way to really prove that is to follow people over time and ask, if they have evidence of amyloid in the brain, and if this tau protein is high, does that mean that they are be going to be convert from normal to demented over the next few years? Because if that's true, then this would be potentially a good biomarker to identify people that might be good for trials to try to prevent the disease. So if you focus on the left panel, <clears throat> What this graph shows are people that we've been following over at least three to five years who started off as cognitively normal, and they're mostly people between the ages of 60 to 80, okay? Most of the people that we're following, these CSF biomarkers, the tau and A-beta 42, if they're within the normal range, then they're in the blue line. And so what you can see is most of the people who have normal values are starting as normal and they're remaining as cognitively normal over at least a three to five year period. There's some, a few of them that the clinicians are feeling are declining, but not very many. However, if you look at the people in the red line whose CSF biomarkers are abnormal, indicating Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, by four years, more than 80% have converted to the very mildest stages of Alzheimer's disease. And this is what convinces me
This kind of data is what convinces me that these biomarkers are potentially going to be very useful at predicting who is going to decline so that we could try to intervene earlier. And I don't, I, I don't get this test on my patients now because we don't yet have a therapy that we know is going to um, uh, delay or prevent the disease at this point. I think I'm very hopeful that there will be drugs and I think they, these kind of markers probably should be used in all trials so that we know who we're treating and not just base it on our clinical examination, which we're sometimes wrong. Um, so this is the kind of data I think is, is really um, exciting. Okay, so um, there's a variety of reasons to be excited. There's a lot of promising treatments in development for Alzheimer's disease. Some of those treatments decrease the production of this amyloid protein that builds up. Some of the treatments remove amyloid from the brain and, and a prob at least in animal models appear to decrease the toxicity of this protein. There's also treatments in development that try to get rid of this tau protein that's accumulating or neutralize its toxicity. Um, and then there, there are currently tr treatments that appear to have some effect on the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease that many of you are familiar with, things that are called cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, but there's also treatments and development that modulate other chemicals in the brain, not just acetylcholine, that are in development. And then finally, there are a variety of treatments that are a little bit earlier stage that are trying to protect the nerve cells in the brain regardless of the reason they're being injured, and that might be another approach um, as a useful treatment. Um, so I'm going to end on this slide because of time and uh, not go through some of the later slides that you can read through in your, in your handout. But I, I, if, you, if you look right now at this graph and you ask, what are the trials that have been done in Alzheimer's disease with potentially disease-modifying therapies? And some of those uh, agents that have been tried the last few years are things that potentially could reduce this amyloid protein in the brain. And if you ask, when were those trials done in the people that have been given these medications, they've been given to people with what our, a clinician would call mild to moderate dementia. So as I showed you earlier, somebody with mild to moderate dementia, their head is already completely filled with amyloid, their brain. The neurofibrillary damage of these, this tau protein is not yet at its maximal extent, but it's on its way there and the amount of nerve cells in the brain is already markedly reduced. So this, in my view, would be like taking somebody who has had three heart attacks, their heart isn't working very well, and then asking whether you gave them a drug that might influence their outcome. It's not the optimal time to be treating the disease. If you could do it earlier, it probably would be much better. Now that's not to say that there aren't treatments that might be effective at that stage of disease, we just don't know that yet. But I think if I was going to, if I didn't know anything else about the field other than what I showed you today, I'd say, well, you know, at least you'd want to start in this preclinical stage of disease when the pathology is building up but the person's still normal to try to protect the brain. And I think that's really where the field is moving. We don't know if the therapies that are being developed will work at that stage, but I think I would hope and think that it's much more likely that they'll work if we, if we start at this stage and not wait till somebody already has lost a lot of uh, function in the brain. So I'm gonna stop there because I think the rest of the slides will take too long to go through and they're more experimental in nature and then we can maybe spend some time with the panel to discuss this topic. So thanks. I'm going to have our panelists come on up as well. Thank you, Dr. Holtzman. That was uh, fantastic and very informative. While the panelists are coming up, I'll introduce them in a moment. I, I have to give you a little insight into some of the thought the Professional Advisory Board gave uh, in, in coming up with this year's topic. Uh, it obviously is, is very heavy in the science, but, but far and away over the past year, uh, the, the buzz that has been created with the, the topic of biomarkers and what it means to the study of Alzheimer's disease is simply profound. And it was just something that we could not ignore and wanted to find a, a practical way to tackle that.
I think Dr. Holtzman has done an outstanding job of, of highlighting that, and I think this, the panel now will give us an opportunity to further uh, develop and, and answer any of the questions that you may have. So without further ado, let me introduce the rest of our panel. Sitting to the left of Dr. Holtzman is Dr. Stephen Baum. Uh, he's a physician in geriatric and internal medicine practicing in Mentor, Ohio, and he is a proud member of our professional advisory board. Uh, next to him is uh, Dr. Paul Ford. Uh, he is the director of neuroethics of the neuroethics program at the Cleveland Clinic, and we will get into uh, a few questions that, that I will throw out, but certainly other questions you may have about uh, ethical issues involved in both preclinical testing as well as genetic testing. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Ms. Christine Nelson is a clinical nurse specialist and the coordinator of Lakewood Hospital Senior Assessment Center, and she's also a member of our professional advisory board. Um, maybe as a, a, a couple ground rules, I am going to throw out a couple initial questions to the panel, but then we certainly want to take ample time to invite questions from the audience. I believe we have, how many mics, one or two? Uh, we have two. So we have two microphones. So what I'm going to ask you to do when it comes uh, time for questions from the audience is raise your hand. Please wait until the microphone gets to you, uh, and then the floor will be yours to ask the question. Uh, so it, maybe it, we should take a, sm a very small step backwards in, in understanding that as... Um, speaking of myself as someone who's spent 15 years in... A, an outpatient setting and an assessment center setting, just to clarify that uh, perhaps a misperception is that there really is no definitive uh, blood test or radiologic test that tells a physician that an individual has Alzheimer's disease. And I, Dr. Holtzman had alluded to that by talking about the, the value of talking to either a close family member or a good friend or acquaintance of the affected individual to truly understand some of those concerns and, and the difficulties in, in trying to flesh out some of these changes in the testing we do. But certainly, uh, up to the present time, uh, the methods that we used included that very detailed history taking as well as uh, evaluation of memory and thinking changes. And often the blood tests and radiologic or x-rays that we did were in an effort to rule out other causes of memory and thinking changes. So to talk about biomarkers or radiologic x-ray tests or even biochemical tests that really hone right down at detecting the disease is, is very exciting. Uh, it's so exciting to the point that recently the new diagnostic criteria and guidelines for uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease have actually addressed and begun to incorporate the use of biomarkers, uh, imaging, and biochemical uh, changes on blood work. Um, so it, it really has gained notice. I guess with that, and, and I'm gonna throw this first question out to Dr. Baum, from a, a clinical standpoint in the, in the office setting, um, have you either had patients coming in requesting this, or what do you find any practical use at all in, in your practice setting currently? Well, I finished my fellowship in uh, 1986 and have yet to order any blood test uh, specific to Alzheimer's disease, specifically the apolipoprotein assay. Um, we've always followed the literature on the the development of biomarkers and look forward to uh, their emergence as a useful tool. Uh, the one that I'm particularly interested in is the uh, uh, genetic test that's going to look at the, it predicts the rapidity of the progression of the disease. Okay, great. And, and Ms. Nelson, I'm going to ask you the same question. Your experience at the Lakewood Senior Assessment Center. Uh, people requesting this or any practical uh, utilization of, of these tools today? Um, you know, I, I think our, our families are wondering about a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. We, we do get that question um, often. Um, I don't think, I don't think uh, at least in my experience, maybe Dr. Tusi would um, uh, know something different, but I don't think that the, that the, the public right now is that familiar with the, this idea of, of biomarkers. Um, I think when it when the word does get out, you know, in, in venues like this, people are going to want to know 
when can we begin to use them? And I actually have a question, if I can ask, of, of, of uh, Dr. Holtzman. Um, for could we use some of the these testing that you know the CSF or and I know the the PIB is that's a machine that's not everywhere, but um, could we do a lumbar puncture to look at the CSF to um, confirm a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? And that's a great question. When would we potentially consider using some of these tools in clinical evaluations? So um, that's a great question. I think that uh, the amyloid imaging that Pittsburgh come on B uh, or similar tests like that are not yet approved, so they're not available for patient care. Mm -hmm. However, the lumbar puncture, CSF tests, actually, you can send out for a clinical test. Um, like my colleague, I've rarely ordered it in patients, but I have occasionally. And they've, it's mostly been in situations where I'm either somebody is very mildly impaired, but we're really not sure what's going on, and it might affect what we, uh, what we do. We want to decide, well, if it's not Alzheimer's disease, then we really might pursue something more. But uh, sometimes people have um, hemorrhages and, or strokes in the outer part of the brain, that, and they don't have Alzheimer's disease, but it's caused by this amyloid protein. And sometimes you, you, there's no other way to diagnose it yet, and sometimes the CSF can be useful for that. So we rare, there are a few instances where I've ordered it, but, and you can send this out, and it's, there's a test that's commercially available from a company called Athena Diagnostics, and it's a, it's a good test. And, but I, you know, I think there's only limited current use personally for it. I think the whole situation will change if there's any treatment that has a disease-modifying effect, then, then I think the ballgame changes sure. at that point. Right. Fantastic. So uh, perhaps just to summarize then, uh, first point is that the, the, the understanding that the medical and, and scientific community is gaining on biomarkers uh, is extremely exciting. It, it really is game-changing. Right now, from a clinical standpoint, when patients come to offices, uh, some of these tests, if even available, are really used in, in atypical or unusual presentations, either in a very young individual or, or a very complex situation, but that predominantly, and again, just to emphasize this, the, the, the excitement and the utility here is in the area of research and the doors that it is going to begin to open up uh, from a research standpoint. So I'll give you one example where I did use this test. I saw a patient last week who I had first seen a year and a half ago, and he was not, he was a pretty young person. He was 58. And um, he, when I first saw him, he, his, his um, change in memory and thinking were very mild, and they, based on standard uh, test, cognitive testing, he would not have met criteria to be in a clinical trial, which there's many clinical trials going on. And he, if he really had Alzheimer's disease, he wanted to be in a clinical trial as soon as his disease was severe enough to allow him to be in one. And so I really wasn't 100% sure he had Alzheimer's disease. So I did get a CSF test. It confirmed he very likely did have Alzheimer's disease. He didn't decline enough to be in a trial until about a year later, but in the last nine months, he's been in a clinical trial, and he really wanted to be in a trial. So I think Great. it helped them in that case. Thank you. Dr. Ford. So I, uh, um, I found the talk fascinating, particularly from a, a non-physician, uh, non-clinician viewpoint. Something that, uh, that you said during the talk, and then again here, um, I always like pointing out when there are um, value choices that we make when we highlight what kinds of things are important to us and justify us doing one thing or another. And I know from the ethics and genetics literature, there are some people who, even if there is nothing you can do about your cancer that you'll develop or your um, Huntington's disease, um, they argue that just because I, I can't do anything about it, I may still plan my life differently. And it may be valuable to me um, even though from a society perspective it may be a poor use of expensive resources, it's valuable, valuable to me in planning my life. And uh, so just to highlight that, that I, I want to point out that you have a, a stance you're taking, which may be perfectly justifiable, but just to say, um, how do you respond to, to, to folks, patients who might come to you and say, I don't care, there's nothing I can do, but I just want peace of mind, for instance. <laughs> 
I've actually faced that several times, and um, if somebody really wants, the only available test really now other than rule out tests are the CSF tests. And so I've had people, and, and if they want it, I mean, insurance often will not pay for it. And I say that if they would like to, are willing to pay for it, I'm willing to do the test because they want to know. And I don't want to say, no, you can't have it. I mean, it's not, it's not a dangerous test or anything, so. So again, the, the, um, the cerebrospinal fluid test or the CSF test then would give us a, a more definitive answer, certainly for an individual who wanted to know with 100% certainty. I think the other question though, that the door that that opens is what about the individual who, who has no signs or symptoms of the disease uh, and wants to be tested? Uh, and then your thoughts, and then I'm actually gonna have Dr. Ford uh, kind of speak to what are some of the things that if these are questions we have, what are some of the things that we should consider if we were ever gonna entertain coming to a doctor's office to ask that question? That's a good question. I've never had anybody actually request the test that's normal yet. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm not 100% sure how I would react from a, I try to get them involved in our research if they, if they really wanna, well, if they're just interested in the topic, but I, I don't know what, how I would answer them at this point. Right. Really kind of at the cutting edge here. Dr. Ford, I mean, again, what really fascinated me, and I, I think your, your comparison, Dr. Holtzman, is, is so appropriate clinically. Again, comparing where we are today with our understanding of cholesterol as a risk factor for heart disease and cerebrovascular disease, and yet we wouldn't think twice about going into our doctor's office and at age 35 and saying, I want to get my cholesterol checked. I want to understand my risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke. And, uh, but of course, that also, we have treatments for that. But again, so if we're beginning to develop the technology to detect preclinical, actual signs in the brain of Alzheimer's disease before we have symptoms, then I'm sure the question is gonna be asked. So I, I think the question I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Ford, is very pertinent, and that is, if we are thinking of, whether it's tomorrow or a year from now or five years from now, but we're thinking about going to the office the same way we would want to have our cholesterol checked, what types of questions should we be thinking about as far as the repercussion of knowing that information? So I think a, a great deal hinges on the, um, where that research goes in terms of uh, whether it's a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or whether it's a risk factor or whether it's a modifiable risk factor. So the, the analogy with cholesterol, you can change your cholesterol and many people think, or there's a good portion of people who think that for, for most people, if you change the cholesterol, then you change the risk for, for heart disease. And if that's true with these amyloids or, or other kinds of things, uh, that takes us in one direction. Um, and in fact, then it raises the question of, if we get this knowledge, then are we somehow responsible or culpable for changing our our life and, and modifying, and, and should that count for us in insurance? You know, if it's genetics, we say, well, I'm dealt a bad hand, we shouldn't discriminate, and we shouldn't pay higher insurance premiums. But if I'm smoking, then that's a uh, modifiable behavior, then I, it's justified to, you know, what kind of, of, of impact? Um, the other thing that I think is important is to ask ourselves from a resource question in society, um, how much risk are we willing to, to stomach? Um, you know, we don't want to put people at risk in research, um, but if we can define Alzheimer's or get good precursors, then we're going to look at how can we modify the disease? Some of those things which may be risky to health. And are we going to feel an obligation to only put at serious risk those who are already have very little to lose, or those who are already normal and working and and could lose a whole lot. I mean, do we have the stomach to say, yeah, we're gonna be willing as a society to put those people at, at, at some risk? The other thing, should we re put our resources in avoiding the, the onset of the disease or those that already have it and trying to find ways to ameliorate uh, their suffering? And these are in limited resources. We have to make these value choices. It's not a, we, I mean, we can try to do it all, but that's a value choice of saying, we're gonna get to everything slower. So we have these tough choices of who is, uh, who's going to be in our focus to either put at risk or help uh, alleviate suffering. So it sounds like a, a lot of uh, interesting questions to begin to think about before this even becomes something that, that's done routinely, but certainly issues of cost.
issues of uh, health insurance, and it, you could talk about what would be appropriate, but we don't, we're not even sure that that's exactly how it would be used, so it could have an effect on health insurance and certainly an effect on, on family and, and what that may mean to relatives. So certainly a, a very thought-provoking. Thought uh, Could I ask a question real fast? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about the concept of um, linking doing these kinds of tests to research? Uh, you know, when people come into my office and ask about them, I say, I don't order them, but uh, there are lots of um, programs that's doing research on Alzheimer's disease, and they frequently do genetic testing as part of their research. And if you really want to know, then go into one of the programs. Um, otherwise, we're going to treat you in the standard fashion. And I was wondering about the ethics of using that approach. So uh, you, thank you. You, uh, you set me up sort of for a law ball kind of uh, <laughs> uh, um, so I think what, what you're, you're pointing to is the question of um, we value people entering research out of a voluntary nature, that they aren't coerced into doing research. And if we say the only way we're going to give you this test is if you allow us to do research on you, then it challenges that question of are they doing it out of sort of altruism or, or, or a sense of, of you know, being voluntary if, if you have that held over their head. And if not, what are the consequences to doing research? If anybody can order it and get it done, are we going to, as a society, get the questions that we need answered if everybody's doing it and not collecting this data? So you're right, voluntariness versus uh, um, expediency, harm. If we don't know really what these mean, and you, again, you had a fantastic question of the, the normal volunteers who had this test, you know, are we really telling them that they, we think they might be, maybe, could be at high risk for Alzheimer's or have Alzheimer's already? And the response was, we don't really know what these tests are. They're research volunteers. And so, again, that's another kind of, uh, kind of fantastic question. I don't know whether you had more in mind when you asked the question. No, I'm just very curious. And, you know, especially when you said at that point that, that the, the volunteers, uh, the, the normal controls were maybe 45 to... to yeah, most of the people people who have the abnormal markers, though, it's very rare to see anybody who doesn't have one of these rare mutations okay. have these changes until they're over 60. Okay. Very rare. So, you know, most of the people we're studying are, have an average age of in the early 70s. And, uh, we do, and they agree when they enter as volunteers that we do not provide them any of the test results because we don't yet, haven't studied enough people to, compl I mean, I showed you data that's mm -hmm. pretty compelling, but it's still a relatively small number of people we're talking about. We've been studying about a little over 300, maybe 25 had converted from normal to impaired. and. Mm -hmm. You know, other people are doing similar studies now, and I, I, you know, until we have larger numbers, I think it's a little dangerous to over-speculate. Okay. I think we're, we're actually running real well with time. There's one other topic that I want to throw out to the panel, and then I am going to, we'll have probably about 25 minutes for the for audience questions. Uh, but a lot of the conversation uh, to this point is really focused on the biomarkers and, and preclinical testing, some of the ethical considerations. One similarly related topic would be that of uh, genetic testing. Uh, an individual has the disease, a family member is concerned. Dr. Holtzman did touch on in one of his slides uh, the very strong uh, genetic connection to early onset, but also understanding that the slide showed that that was extremely rare form, less than 1% of all cases uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And there was a genetic connection or correlation with the later onset, but it did not mean that you would automatically get the disease. So I guess first to Dr. Baum and Ms. Nelson, have people come in asking questions about genetic testing and whether they should do that? And how do you respond to that? You know, we have had, um, I, I, it's not, not a lot of people, but, but people have asked about, you know, their, their loved one presumably has Alzheimer's disease, and, you know, sh is there a test? You know, should I be tested myself? And um, I don't think we've ever ordered anything in, in our center, so we would probably refer them on, at, at, in the past, we would refer them on to a research, you know, okay. center. more. Um, I point out that we have no disease-modifying agent for Alzheimer's disease. If you're going to get it, you're going to get it, um, and uh, put them in the direction of 
uh, uh, lifestyle changes that might uh, improve their chances of maintaining their cognition as long as uh, they can, including exercise, not smoking, uh, not watching TV. <laughs> so, Dr. Ford, uh, ultimately then I'm sure people get directed to you with these types of issues. Uh, so how do you approach this issue for people who are referred to your center? You know, the thing about uh, genetics um, is it that oftentimes it says something about you, but it also says something and information about those who are genetically related to you. You know, you got these genes, you know, through your family. And so recognize, really a tough question, recognizing that um, this information may rightfully belong to all of you. And some people may want to know and, and wouldn't have thought to ask, and if you get the information, what's your obligation to, to all those other people who either may want to know or may not want to know. You know, about a, 10 years ago now, I went in to get a, you mentioned cholesterol. I went in, had a, a workup because I had abnormal values. And uh, without sort of really explanation, I had an AP, wow. APO, APOE, a, APOE uh, wow. um, test. And uh, so, and it is marked, it is sort of a marker about cholesterol levels. And, but many of these genetics and biomarkers may have dual meanings. So the cat's out of the bag if you get a, um, a genetic uh, test for one thing or a, a biomarker for one thing, and suddenly, you know, you may not have wanted to know you were a risk for Alzheimer's, but guess what? So, so these kind of dual diagnoses, these kinds of reasons we run the tests, what it means, are all fantastically important to, to think ahead of time. Great point, and especially with, well, I guess I, I would ask, that there are certainly some tests that are being marketed to the public that whether it be a hair analysis, urine analysis, saliva, what, what's your thoughts on, on those? Uh, yeah, no, you, you, you've hit one of the, uh, the major uh, genetics questions that balances each person's right and liberty to, to gain the information they want and our desire to make sure that we regulate and get people good information so they don't harm themselves by, by sort of going after testing that, uh, that isn't necessary. So the idea being, you can mail order something, but the interpretation of what that genetics means isn't so simple as I understand it. I mean, it's not a, you're either yes or no, it's what's the risks and what does that mean? And so we usually send them to genetics counselors and uh, other, other folks who have uh, knowledge of not just that this is a test, but what does it really mean to me in my circumstance? Fantastic. So again, really to emphasize that uh, the, the technology is developing where we're where some of this information may be available to us, but certainly in situations such as these, uh, a thoughtful discussion prior to uh, just simply uh, finding out an answer is probably well indicated and warranted. And one other point I want to make, I just want to emphasize what, what Dr. Holtzman said in his lecture, is that the, the excitement here uh, in finding the biomarkers is really in picking up on this disease earlier or even in a preclinical state. So again, moving to where instead, in using that example of cardiovascular disease, rather than looking for treatments that are indicated for someone who's already had the heart attack, how do we look at the biomarkers and target the biomarkers to prevent the heart attack? And so again, while it doesn't have a huge application today for clinical purposes, to be able to use these technologies to identify people earlier in their disease state has a profound implication on developing treatments that either can arrest this disease or certainly begin to treat it at a much earlier state than where we are picking it up today. So, and, and that truly is, is very exciting. And so with that, again, I will remind you, just raise your hands. We have two microphones. Um, and, and really, any thoughts, questions, topics on Alzheimer's disease, dementia, evaluation. We've got a really uh, well-versed panel here that can speak to almost any question you may have. Um, and so I'll go ahead and, okay, right there. I, I have a, a question that isn't, I, I notice as just as a function of age, I can no longer run as fast as I used to. I can't lift as much weight. Is there some memory or cognitive loss that's just a result of age and not necessarily a disease or a precursor of disease? Oh, <laughs> jump right in, panel. Um, you know, I think I think the, the short answer is is yes. There's probably some mild changes, 
uh, that will take place. Um, our, our thinking will slow a little bit. It may take us longer to come up with the name for something or the, or the word right when you want it. Uh, so, so general you know, slowing uh, of, of thinking and thought and, and processing. But you know, when there's a pattern to you know, uh, not coming up with the word when you want it, when there's a pattern to maybe forgetting things, then we should be concerned about something beyond normal aging. There's also a, a slowing in your ability to learn new information, uh, but it's kind of like your hard drive. It's going to take longer to find the information, but the total capacity should remain the same. It's definitely not normal to be repeating yourself, even with, with normal aging. And, and when we've studied people over time who are elderly, who are cognitively normal, even though there is slowing of processing, when you look at somebody's standardized test taking, it actually stays the same or gets better with age if you keep taking the same test every year. Mm -hmm. So it just shows the capacity of even the aging brain to retain new information. Great. And I think we have a question right there in the center. Shall I go? Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm concerned with, isn't there a different uh, molecular, molecular uh, co consistency in alloyed uh, that could be dealt with and find out how to dissolve it or take it away or what causes the body to form it as we've done with cholesterol? Uh, is there a way to d dissolve it or change lifestyle so that that plaque doesn't occur? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of evidence that these amyloid plaques, at least in animal studies and in some human studies, can be dissolved and removed. And some of the largest treatment trials that are currently ongoing right now in people are to, testing, to test whether antibodies that are given to people will remove the amyloid from the brain of humans and whether or not it will improve their function. So we don't know whether that will work in humans, but it does appear to have very strong effects in animal studies that are positive. Um, there's also evidence that I didn't talk about that are in your slides that even other normal ways, there are maybe normal ways to slow the buildup of amyloid in the brain. So for example, parts of the brain, it turns out that normal neural activity is responsible for producing amyloid normally. And um, there's parts of the brain that are very susceptible to building up amyloid. And it may, it may be, some of our results would suggest that the more cognitively active you are is protective against amyloid deposition, perhaps because it turns down these areas that are susceptible. So that's still, it's, it's early in the days of studying this, but it suggests, for example, that getting a really good night's sleep is help, perhaps helpful in this. Staying uh, treated, for, uh, preventing depression might be helpful for this. Reducing stress might be helpful for this. Actually reducing amyloid, so. Mm -hmm. And if I could point out that this is now, I think, the third reference on the panel to some non-pharmacologic or non-medication type uh, uh, interventions. While the science admittedly may not be extraordinarily robust, I, I think we're starting to collect a fair amount of information on what, what, for lack of a better term, a healthy lifestyle. So staying both cognitively active, staying physically active, getting a good night's sleep, a healthy diet, um, all can have uh, positive benefits either in prevention or certainly in, in slowing. Um, and certainly the side effects of such are, are minimal compared to the, their medication counterparts. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. In terms of long-term studies, long, longitudinal, have there been any that have um, examined um, Alzheimer's development? I mean, even starting as young as <laughs> infancy or at least at a younger age than when someone starts to show the signs and have there been results of that or is that a research area that may come in the future? So there's actually been a lot of studies in this regard, not in, um, in particular populations of people. So for example, um, it turns out that uh, you probably know of Down syndrome called trisomy 21 in which children are born with a genetic abnormality where they have two, three copies of chromosome 21. 
And everybody with Down syndrome, typically by the age of 50 or so, will develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. And you can see some of the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome children who are less than 10 years old. Now that doesn't happen in non-genetic, you know, if you don't have that change, it doesn't happen that early. But that's the one population that's been studied very early in life. I, oh. yeah. yeah, go on. I was just going to point out that I've been to many of the Foley lectures and they've all been very enjoyable, but the one that I enjoyed absolutely the most was when we had David Snowden here, <laughs> who uh, did the famous nun study that made the front of Time magazine that showed that you can track back early uh, uh, changes in people's writings and language skills uh, to their teenage years. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other research that has been done at those earlier stages. Is that um, right? So I think there's another. There's also another study that's very similar to the Snowden study that's been out of Rush University. That's also with um, nuns who are in a very similar environment that suggests that or, um, IQ or performance at a young age is perhaps predictive of risk. It doesn't. It's not really clear why that is, um, actually, yet, I would say. Okay. Other questions? Uh, okay, over there. For families that have um, an elderly relative who's been diagnosed with mild uh, dementia, what do you recommend in terms of um, practical daily support and especially for emotional support? What can family members do to help that person cope with their diagnosis? Fantastic. Oh, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, at least I'm, I'm sure we might all want to chime in. Um, you know, it depends on if, if the older person is, is safe to be alone. We'd want to know, you know, are they safe to, to live alone and, and, and be alone if, if that's the situation for them. Um, if they are not, um, and of course, e you know, even if they are safe to be alone, it's important for uh, a person, really any person, but certainly somebody with a memory loss, um, even mild dementia, to be with other people. And you know, some of the things that were talked about earlier, to, you know, to, to stay active and to participate in group activities, whether it's you know, crafts or um, music or exercise. Uh, so participating in some kind of a group activity so that a person is not at home watching TV. Mm -hmm. Um, keeping their mind active, um, even though the dementia is there, it's important to continue to, you know, obviously utilize brain function, uh, be with other people, socialize, use the language skills. Um, and as far as support for family, of course, you know, we're going to want you to uh, attend a support group uh, through the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, throughout uh, the, the, the wide area here, there are, I don't know how many support groups are there, Nan? over 30 support groups. Uh, for uh, family members caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And, and it's just um, the best thing that you can do to feel, um, you know, getting support from those that are actually, you know, doing the same thing that you're doing, um, and obviously to provide that support back to, uh, to those around you. Any other? No, very well okay. spoken. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, right here in front. Has the amyloid beta protein been shown to have any positive effect on the body? And if not, have they started researching maybe just destroying the body's ability to produce it in general? Right. So there's a, a, a much larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein uh, that many scientists have studied. And that's the, that amyloid peptide is, comes from this bigger amyloid precursor protein. And there's a fair amount of evidence that the amyloid precursor protein has some functions that are normal in the body, in the brain, for example. Um, the amyloid peptide itself, it's not entirely clear whether it has a normal function or not. And there are methods that have been developed to inhibit the enzymes that enable the amyloid peptide to be produced. And some of those drugs uh, that do that are in trials to treat Alzheimer's disease or prevent it. So. Great. Question over there. I'd first like to say that I'm very pleased to see that people are dedicated towards unraveling part of Alzheimer's disease. And my, my question is, where does one go 
as a human being who begins to think that he has the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You know, it's, uh, I have often been jumped into, I have often jumped into hopscotching doctors through specialties, and it's got quite expensive. Where would be the first place to start? I mean, typically, so you asked about Parkinson's disease, correct? If you think you might have Parkinson's disease. So the types of physicians that really specialize in that are neurologists. And um, I certainly would try to see somebody who's a neurologist that knows a lot about Parkinson's disease so they could best answer your question whether you, you know, very likely have it or not. And then there are specific treatments that you can take for Parkinson's disease. So I would go to an expert in the area that knows a lot about Parkinson's disease. And the colleagues to my left probably know which places would, they would recommend, but I, I think there's no question I would try, I, if it was me, I'd try to see a neurologist who specializes in that. Could I ask a question real fast? Are there any uh, bleed overs, uh, biomarkers in the dementia of Parkinson's disease in your research? Uh, that's a really good question. There are some, some people that develop Parkinson's later on also develop dementia and some don't. And it turns out that some of the same biomarkers I showed you today are also turning out to probably be biomarkers for the dementia of Parkinson's disease. So the amyloid peptide is, is also a biomarker for the dementia of Parkinson's. And there's a protein that builds up in the brain of Parkinson's disease patients called synuclein. And that protein in the spinal fluid is also promising as a potential biomarker for whether somebody has Parkinson's for sure or not. Um, and it's not clear yet whether it's a predictive biomarker, but it's, a, it's probably going to turn out to be a good diagnostic biomarker. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a question over? Yes. Um, first question, the IQ, you said a younger IQ, a higher IQ or a lower IQ is a precursor? Oh, so the, you're oh. referring to the NUN study by David Snowden. So what they found was the linguistic ability is determined in a writing sample if, it was, if somebody had higher linguistic ability, their risk for Alzheimer's disease was lower. It wasn't, it wasn't like a definitive thing. If you had a high ability, you definitely didn't get it, or, but there was a, a trend that you would have less risk to show signs of the disease. Okay. The other comment I want to make is um, early onset is less than 1%. Unless you have early onset, then it's 100%. Right. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the um, Cleveland Alzheimer's Association is absolutely terrific. I have um, early onset, and they have really helped my family a lot and gotten us through everything. The other thing I want to know is I'm 54 and she's 30, no. I'm 57 and she's 34. What if she gets tested? She'll never be able to get life insurance, short-term disability, long-term disability, health insurance. If she was tested, she was positive. But wouldn't we want to start her on medication before she got as bad as I was when I got diagnosed? So there, there are uh, regulations against uh, genetic discrimination in, uh, um, that federally got, got put in place so that uh, the special class of genetic diseases. Now, whether those are going to apply to biomarkers is, is different, but, but I think you said early onset are genetically, yes. genetically linked. And so in that way, um, society has made a choice that even though the insurance company is going to have to pay more because you're a higher risk, that you deserve the right to be able to get health insurance. And so that's, that's the, uh, the one caveat, but that may not be true again for the biomarkers. If the biomarkers are the other group of people um, get this, it's unclear whether they're going to be protected by these kind of regulations or not. So, so right now though, we don't have any proven therapy for somebody who is at high, you know, is going to get the disease because of a genetic uh, change. But there is a very large international study called the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network, or DIAN. And there are sites not only in St. Louis, but there's also sites in, a site in Pittsburgh. Uh, you may, I don't know if you're involved in that, but there's a way to at least potentially get uh, testing if you want it, or um, not get the testing but be involved in studies. And some of the studies in the next year will likely include um, the ability to be in clinical trials to try to delay the onset of the symptoms. I sort of have a two-part question. First, in your studies, have any of the current medications 
used in Alzheimer's shown any effects? And second, it appears from your study that there's a point where medication wouldn't be advised. And today, I assume that most people just take it up until, you know, maybe they pass on or, or go into hospice. And so those, those two areas, if you could address that, Doctor. Well, so the symptomatic therapies for Alzheimer's disease, cholinesterase inhibitors are another drug called memantine. There have been large clinical trials showing that they do have some effect on memory and thinking. They're not dramatic, and they do tend to slow the decline to some extent. So there's already been studies now. Do those, uh, mar do those currently approved medicines have effects on these biomarkers? No one has ever shown that to date. Um, so that's why a lot of people call them symptomatic therapies, but not disease-modifying therapies. Does that include the uh, Pittsburgh agent? Correct. No one's shown that a, a colon, like Aricept or other cholinesterase inhibitors affect the amyloid in the brain. So I, I think one question that I think is embedded in there or else at least interests me, um, is there a progression in the disease where the little bit of improvement in memory or in cognition, that those drugs aren't nicely balanced against the burden of taking them or side effects or cost? You know, how do you start thinking about when, when you advise a family to say, or, or do you ever say, yeah, it's gonna, the scores are going to change, but it's not going to change their life. Just let them be and not force them these medications. Is, is that something you, you, you approach? I do all frequently. I mean, usually um, most of the patients that will come into an outpatient clinic, in my experience, are up to about the moderate stage. And, it, and you know, at those levels of illness, I think most families still would want some um, to keep somebody at a sl somewhat better level than they otherwise would be. But I think beyond that is really up to each individual family and the choices that they may or may not have discussed with the patient before. And um, so I think it's, it really comes down to an individual uh, level at each, for each patient as to whether, how long you continue the medication. I, I would just chime in and, and, and agree with that. I think, um, you know, families... And, and, and patients, too, when um, they feel better that they're, they're doing something by, by taking a medication. And families oftentimes feel that it's, you know, maybe it's a modest benefit, but they, they feel that there has been some improvement uh, with the medication, so, you know, they, they want to continue them. At the same time, some, you know, many patients can't tolerate the, the you know, the medication for one reason or, or another. And so um, they're stopped, and they may be taking maybe Nemenda, but not one of the cholinesterase inhibitors, or you know they're taking nothing at all. Or for some, even though these are um, many are available uh, um, generically, some people can't afford the medication, so they're they're not on it for that reason. Right. I, I, I would just like to reinforce what what the panelists have said as well. Um, doing a, a fair amount of work in the skilled nursing setting. Um, I, I may personally see a population that has moderate to severe illness and will tell you that, again, I think it's a constant risk-benefit analysis with medications because, as, as Ms. Nelson pointed out, um, all medication has a risk of side effect. Uh, so it's important to understand what the most common side effects could be with these medications. Uh, on the flip side, that while there is a modest benefit to the medications, the, the benefit tends to flesh out in almost all the literature uh, on the medications, and there may be. Again, it, it's not uh, one of these things where it, it's very cut and dry, but, but there is some evidence to suggest that there could be an impact on an individual's level of function, and certainly whether they are at home or in the skilled nursing setting, the more an individual is able to do for themselves, the less caregiver stress there is. So again, it, it's weighing, are we seeing problems, are we seeing concerns, quality of life, what were the desires of this individual to begin with, and potential benefits. But I, I would just add that the benefits may be a, a little bit beyond just simply preservation of memory. There may be other effects or benefits of this medication as well. Um, and all of that should be considered in, in making a decision. I, I think we may have time for one more question. Is You mentioned a couple times this evening about television watching being some kind of risk. Uh, 
And I was wondering if you meant like the mindless kind of TV shows or like History Channel if you're really into it or PBS for little kids, some kind of educational stuff, <clears throat> excuse me. Or even if you would comment on video games because, you know, my teenage kids, they love to play video games. And they're always telling me it's really educational and it's, it's sharpening their reflexes and all sorts of things like that. So thank you. Um, I'll take that okay. one. Uh, there's a lot of uh, data that's been coming out on uh, how um, different things that you do in your life uh, decrease your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as you get older. And if you are going to get it, it's going to preserve cognitive skills. And we've talked about uh, that a little bit. Some of it are uh, cardiovascular risk factors, keeping your blood pressure down, keeping your cholesterol down. Uh, some of it is social. And there's all kinds of gradation uh, that uh, interacting with non-family members is better than interacting with family members, which is better than interacting with nobody. <laughs> um, one of the things that seems to be uh, quite protective against um, Alzheimer's disease is education. And there was a study that came out that showed that your risk of Alzheimer's disease was uh, somewhat related uh, to how much TV you watch, but that's really a secondary, uh, as it turns out, people, the more education you have, the less TV you watch. So it's really an education effect. Other thoughts on that? I, I certainly, I will tell you, I, I always preach moderation, uh, but quality of life enters into that. You know, if you're eating a healthy diet, you exercise religiously and just happen to love going home at 9 o'clock tonight and watching Modern Family, uh, I mean, say God bless. Um, but again, if, if you're spending your entire days on a, on a couch and, and are le leading an unhealthy lifestyle, that's probably, I, I think the, the message here is that I don't know that there's any real solid science to indicate um, avoiding television uh, to a degree of, of not at all, but certainly the, the lifestyles that lead to more activity, more social engagement, um, more uh, physical activity, uh, certainly there seems to be a trend to the positive for many of the, of the health outcomes. So I guess I really want to say thank you. It's, we're butting up right up to 7 o'clock. I um, want to thank the wonderful input of our panel. And, and Dr. Holtzman's uh, wonderful talk. Uh, one quick note before we close tonight. Uh, I, I certainly want to extend an invitation to all of you to the kickoff of National Alzheimer's Disease Aware, Awareness Month uh, on this coming Monday, October 31st, from 9.15 to 9.45 a.m. at Tower City. Uh, we are extremely honored that Senator Sherrod Brown will give a brief speech recognizing November as this special month while also calling attention to the need for heightened awareness of both Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's Association. These flyers are available on the registration table. Uh, please be sure to complete your evaluation form. I can assure you that the Professional Advisory Board takes uh, these comments seriously and helps to guide future programs. Um, for those of you requesting CEUs, you will need to exchange your completed evaluation for the CEU certificate. Uh, we'll collect them on the way out. And otherwise, we look uh, forward to seeing you again next year, and thanks for coming.